welcome to the Egalitarian Connection, your connection to Christians with Biblical Equality, Archaeology, and the Persecuted Church. Today we will continue with the Too Long in the Sun Armory of Truth series with Richard Reeves from Primetime Christian Broadcasting. In the first part of this video, Richard Reeves will explain to us what happened to the Area New Testament Church when it fled at the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. In the second part, he will be explaining how the imaginations of men replace God's truth by the inventions of men. The Apostle Paul says that the human inventions are without excuse. Listen to what he said in Romans 1.20. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what was made. So if that they are without excuse. Now let's watch this video. <laughs> Throughout the ages, pagan sun worship has been the apostate form of religion which opposed the true worship of our Creator. Knowing that sin is the transgression of the law and that the wages of sin is death, our adversary, by way of various aspects of sun worship, attempts to persuade us to break the first four commandments which teach us how to love the Lord. In 66 AD, the Roman general Cestius Gallus besieged Jerusalem. Historians say that Gallus would have taken the city had he continued in battle for just one more hour. But for some unexplained reason, he retreated. Christians living in Jerusalem remember that Jesus had said that when they saw Jerusalem encompassed with armies, flee to the mountains. They fled across the Jordan River to Pella and were not in Jerusalem when the city was finally taken by Titus in A.D. 70. Over one million of the inhabitants of Jerusalem died and up to 100,000 were taken captive. Christianity, on the other hand, survived in Pella and in the other parts of the world where it had been spread. In 120 A.D., the Roman emperor Hadrian built the pagan city of Aelia Capitolina on the ruins of Jerusalem. Up until that time, Christians living in Judea kept the commandments of God while worshiping Christ. After this time, however, anyone holding beliefs that could be associated with the God of Judaism were denied entry into the city. These Christians were truly the remnant of the very first group of believers. However, at this point in history, they were now considered narrow-minded and unenlightened because they refused to relinquish the faith set by Jesus taught by his disciples, and practiced by the believers of the first century. Welcome to our program, Too Long in the Sun. We invite you to join with us as we earnestly contend for the faith once delivered to the saints. Our topic today will be flee to the mountains. Now, this program is not about prophecy. Some people think this has happened in the past. Some people think it'll happen in the future. And some people think it happened in the past and will happen in the future. What we're going to be discussing today is the fact that after this took place, that the true worship of our Creator, uh, or true Christianity, if you will, uh, went straight downhill after this time. The believers were denied entrance into Jerusalem if they even thought about keeping God's commandments. Uh, so that's what we'll be discussing on this program. Now, uh, what we have to say is not that important compared to what the Bible has to say. So let's start having a look at some of the scriptures, and today's scripture will be Luke 21, uh, 20 through 24. And we'll refer to a few other scriptures as we go here. And when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, or compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out. And let not them that are in the countries enter, into, enter thereinto. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days, for there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people. 
and they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led captive, led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now, this is the footnotes from the works of Josephus, and I have here the book of Josephus. This is something you can get in your uh, uh, local Christian bookstore. It's not hardly hard to find. And Josephus gives us an eyewitness account of what took place in A.D. 70 and the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, it's really interesting reading. One thing that I learned in here that they actually used elephants to fight. And uh, I never would imagine that from just reading the scriptures. But uh, we know that the Romans actually used ele elephants in the uh, battle against Jerusalem. I'm going to put the, what uh, the book says right on the screen here so you can have a look. This is the footnotes, and it's speaking about Cestius Gallus. Uh, you can find this in the Wars of the Jews, chapter 19, if you want to uh, go look this up for yourself. It says, There may be another very important and very providential reason be here assigned for this strange and foolish retreat by Cestius Gallus. It says, Affording the Christians in the city an opportunity of calling to mind the prediction and caution given them by Christ that when they should see Jerusalem encompassed with armies, they should flee to the mountains. By complying, with, uh, by complying with which those Jewish Christians fled to the mountains of Perea and escaped this destruction. So we're told here that the Christians went to the mountains of Perea to a place called Pella. And uh, this is a map of uh, Israel and Jordan, and you can see Pella there right on the other side of the Jordan River. Now, I'd like to go to some other scriptures, Matthew 4, uh, verses 23 through 25. Pella was one of the Decapolis, uh, the ten cities. It says, Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went through all Syria, and they brought unto him all the sick people that were taken with divers diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, and he healed them. And there followed with him a great multitudes of people from Galilee and from Decapolis, and uh, Pella was one of those ten cities, and from Jerusalem and from beyond Judea, and from Judea and from beyond Jordan. So uh, we uh, know that the ten cities, uh, one of them was Pella, another was Beth Shan. Over on the other side of the Jordan River, I think Beth Shan was the only one of the ten cities that was on the Israel side of the Jordan River. But uh, people from that area had heard about Jesus. They, he, they came to him, and of course he healed them. Uh, we were ready to read about the wild man of the Gadarenes, and uh, we're going to be having a look here in just a minute at a, uh, some video from Gadara, uh, which is on, his way, uh, on the way up out of the Jordan River Valley uh, as we head toward uh, Pella. So at this time, I'd like to go ahead and let us have a look at this video. Uh, it's entitled Pella here, and we'll go ahead and start it, and I'll kind of tell you a little bit about what we've seen over there. Uh, these are the mountains of Perea here, looking back across the Jordan River Valley. Uh, you can see the valley there, and that's the mountains of Samaria on the other side, over in Israel. A uh, fairly fertile area, but if you'll notice, it's not that fortified. The people just did what Jesus said, and he took care of them over there. Uh, not, not fortresses and all that, but they were just obedient to what he said. They got out of there, and because of that, he took care of them. Now, these are the first century ruins here. You can see uh, some of the uh, buildings of the first century that have been demolished. The Romans, of course, had this area. Uh, Rome ruled the world, and as we've seen on other videos, uh, they were right here at Pella too at, at later times. Uh, once again, first century Pella. You can see how they built the walls out of stone. And uh, this area is important because what happened here is the believers that believed in keeping the scriptures, uh, doing what the scripture said, got out of Jerusalem, and they were not there in A.D. 70 when Titus sacked the city. And we're told that from here they went to Berea and other parts of the world, and we read about the Bereans in the Bible searching the scriptures. Now, uh, once again, the Romans got involved. This was from the third century here, and you can see they built pagan temples right here. But uh, the believers were here, and I can promise you they had nothing to do with paganism. And uh, they did what Jesus said, and because of that, they escaped the description of Jerusalem and brought with them uh, the scriptures and preserved the scriptures so that people could really know the truth. 
And once again, here's the Jordan River Valley looking across there. And uh, this is uh, the area of Pella over in Jordan. At this time, we're going to uh, discuss these things and talk about what happened after the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. And we're going to go over and join with uh, Pastor R.C. Sandifer. Uh, thank you for being with us again, Pastor Sandifer. Glad to be here. Uh, God takes care of his people, doesn't he? Has, and there's no uh, record of anything so faithful as the father taking care of his children. I know he's really blessed us. You know, a lot of people, uh, you know, need, need help, and we don't, we, don't, we don't serve him because we want him to do something. We serve him because he's already done it. That's right. Uh, okay. He sent his son to, uh, to lay down his life for us and to pay the penalty for the transgression of his commandments, and uh, we love him because of that. And I know you uh, know a little bit about, uh, you've had kind of a message from him about that. Would you care to share that with us? Well, the, the, the main thing is, is that uh, Yeshua was the Torah. He was the commandments. And you cannot be at enmity or against the commandments and accept uh, Yeshua or be in acceptance of Yeshua. And he gave us uh, a spirit, the Ruach HaKadosh. He breathed the breath of life in us that we would not be at enmity with uh, the, the commandments, that we would be in agreement with it. And Constantine and the group in the Council of Nicaea brought about most of the traditions that we have in our uh, churches today. We've uh, just put the traditions of men in place rather than the commandments of uh, Yahweh. And what happens is that uh, we're several generations down the, the road now. And the New Testament spoke of man's love waxing cold. Well, that's not necessarily man's love toward one another. That's man's love toward the Father and uh, his commandments. We know that, uh, you know, I think it was 135 A.D., uh, Hadrian built a pagan temple on the Temple Mount. They had a temple tax. And uh, if you wanted to keep God's commandments, you couldn't even get back in Jerusalem. That's right. And from that time on, things went uh, downhill pretty fast. Uh, the so-called church fathers write a lot, and people say, well, look, they said this or they said that. Mm -hmm. But by the time they wrote, things were so polluted that uh, you just really, you know, you really have to cut through what they're, <laughs> what they're telling you to find the truth. This is true. The, the first hundred years after the apostles uh, went to be with the Father, uh, there was a real struggle about what was going to be involved in the uh, Arians and the Gnosticists and so on and so forth brought in a lot of the paganism and promoted these paganistic ideas. Well, the church, in order to uh, grow through Constantine, uh, accepted people in without a regeneration uh, experience. It was not a requirement to be regenerated or even to believe in Yeshua HaMashiach in order to be a member of that church. Well, today we've uh, maybe modernized that a little bit. We require that you join Club Jesus to <laughs> be a member of the church, but uh, many times we do exactly like Constantine did. We embrace the paganism and we don't address it because it upsets members sometimes because they like their holidays. Have you ever set up, upset any of your members before? Well, yes, sir. There was a... <laughs> There's, there's been a couple of them that have uh, really got in my face and uh, uh, told me that this wasn't uh, the way that, uh, uh, that they felt like the Father was leading them. And, uh, of course, obviously, uh, he led them out the door. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you have to just keep preaching the truth. Uh, the Bible says there are a few people that want to hear that. Yes, sir. And uh, I know that many of the things that we talk about... Uh, People think that we're anti-grace, but that's not the truth. Mm -hmm. uh, there's all kind of people that uh, that want to keep God's commandments. I've never heard of one of them that want to do away with grace. We mm -hmm. certainly want to do that. But, you know, uh, there's all kind of people that want to talk about grace, 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 that want to do mm -hmm. away with God's commandments any way they can. And uh, we talked about on the other program that you can't have grace without the law. That's right. Well, Paul summed it up real good. He said, 
you know, where sin abounds, no matter how dirty and how sinful I am, whenever I come to the Father through Yeshua HaMashiach, that there's enough grace to clean me up and to remove my past sins from me. But he also said, what shall we say then? So that grace more abounds to get even more grace from the Father, shall we continue in sin that grace more abounds? God forbid. God forbid. God forbid. God forbid. Right. We can't, can't practice sin. Uh, this is Jeremiah chapter 44 here. Uh, I think this applies maybe to you, Pastor Sandifer. You're telling people uh, mm -hmm. don't do these things. This is Jeremiah 44. It says, The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah concerning all the Jews which dwelt in the land of Egypt, in which dwelt at Migdal. Uh, he goes on to say, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Ye have seen all the evil that I have brought upon Jerusalem and upon all the cities of Judah, and behold, this day they are a desolation. Mm -hmm. And uh, in one of our other programs, we've uh, seen uh, Chorazin, where Jesus mm -hmm. said, War unto thee, Chorazin, for if the mighty works were done in thee. And we've had a look at Chorazin and what happened there. It says, uh, They are desolation, and no man dwelleth therein, because of their wickedness which they have committed to promote, provoke me to anger, in that they went to burn incense and to serve other gods whom they knew not, neither they ye nor your fathers. Howbeit I sent unto you all my servants the prophets, rising up early and sending them, saying, O oh, do not this abominable thing that I hate. And I think that's what you're doing. You're telling people don't do these abominable things. Uh, it goes on to say, But they hearken not, neither incline their ears to turn from their wickedness to burn incense unto other gods. And we've talked about the Queen of Heaven, which yeah. has come down to us as Easter. Wherefore my fury and mine anger was poured forth and was kindled in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, and they are wasted and desolate as at this day. And that's what happened in A.D. 70. Exactly. Exactly. <clears throat> the, the, all the appointed times of the Father was changed in pagan times that were substituted in his place. Sabbath. There's record that the whole known world was keeping the Sabbath that's right. until Constantine uh, made it against the law to keep the Sabbath and made it against the law to work on Sunday or to do any work on Sunday. What he did was just merely transferred uh, holidays from uh, Father Yahweh's appointed time, the Sabbath that we were commanded to keep, to the uh, sun god's day, which was paganism, brought it in, and made it against the law to keep the, the feast of the Father or the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. In fact, one of those uh, books that talks about uh, those things is the book of Juice, uh, Josephus that we uh, referred to earlier. Right. It says that the whole known world during the first century was resting on the Sabbath day. And uh, Philo says the same thing. He was another first century right. historian. Philo confirms it. I really would like to caution uh, uh, ministers and pastors today not to go the way of Balak. Balak could not curse the Father's people, but he did the next best thing uh, that the king wanted him to do. He put a stumbling block in front of them, and uh, what he did was cause them to follow after other gods and do things that were an abomination to the Father so that they would curse themselves. And uh, the uh, scriptures tell us that Balak was mad. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Everything didn't work out exactly no, like sir. he thought, did it? No, uh, well, we've got to do what he says, whether we like it or not, if, if for our own good. Yes. Uh, I always tell people, uh, you know, I want to know the truth whether I like it or not. That's right. And uh, he is the truth. And, uh, you know, uh, it was part of our creator that was on Mount Sinai that wrote those commandments in stone. And I know we've talked about that. Mm -hmm. uh, he is the truth. He's the word. Mm -hmm. And uh, that word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Yes. And he said that until heaven and earth pass away, not one jot nor tittle shall pass from the law. That's right. And uh, last time I looked, or heaven and earth were still out there. <laughs> well, my understanding is that uh, Yeshua was the Torah, and if we do away with the Torah or the law, then we've done away with Yeshua or Jesus Christ. I have a letter here. Uh, some people might think that you're being a little bit hard on everybody. Let me read you this letter. <laughs> yeah. uh, it said, read your book some years ago, just found your website, uh, agree so very much with what you say on the page, another Jesus. Compromise is not love. Mm -hmm. A messenger of the Lord who will not compromise the truth, but who loves her and is jealous for her, and she goes on to say here, or um, I think it's a lady, that Yeshua is that truth, 
is most definitely not on a popularity trip. Are you on a popularity <laughs> trip? Uh, if I am, I'm a total failure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It says, uh, it is that love of the truth which refuses to deny his name and all what it stands for, which the Lord gives as the reason for his promise of escape to the church of brotherly love, or Philadelphia. It is the love of the truth, the word of God, and our faithful and patient obedience to it that holds the promise of escape from the coming trials. And there are trials coming. We, yes, there are. We've talked about a little bit about that privately. People think that, uh, I guess, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. But there are future judgments coming on this earth. And we don't hear much about that these days. And the Father says that we're to withdraw from the system, this Babylonian system that he's talking about here, that we be not partakers of her judgment. Come out of her. That's right. That's right. It's, it's future judgment coming, and people are not uh, hearing about that. But anyway, it goes on to say, yes, to truly love means to be willing to be rejected. As I always tell the people, you do not save a person who is about to fall into a deep pit with a candy stick, but with a firm grip. <laughs> uh, they go on to say, you're doing a good job. <laughs> so. Like we're trying to use that firm grip and tell people that, uh, you know, what we've been taught is just not the truth. Uh, I didn't know these things, and, uh, you know, the more we study, the more we learn. The Bible says, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Uh, I didn't know any better. But once I found out the truth, I, I had a choice. Who am I going to serve? Am I going to serve my Creator and do what He says, or am I going to serve some uh, uh, tradition mm -hmm. that has no basis uh, with, in the scriptures. Well, part of our human nature is, is when legend becomes more widely accepted than truth, then to us, legend becomes truth. But obviously, the Father has no human nature in him. He is divine. And no matter how hard the legend gets or how widely believed it is, it's still not truth. The truth is still the truth. So we've heard legends. What we've heard is traditions and pagan uh, uh, ideas and concepts of other gods. And the legend has become more widely accepted today than the truth is. And so we need to get rid of the legend and get back to the truth and understand that the Father does require of us to be righteous and holy and to love him by keeping his commandments. Uh, one of the things that uh, uh, is we're taught in the scriptures is that if we say, we love him, and we keep not his commandments. We're a liar, and we do not the truth. That's right. And, you know, you talk about the legends and the uh, mythology, mm -hmm. you might say. Uh, educated people are well aware of the things we talk about. Sure. And uh, so, but they really don't know what the Bible teaches. They think the Bible teaches that Jesus practiced all those uh, traditions and, and the things we read about in mythology. So they come to the conclusion that it's just rehashed paganism. You know, and uh, I really have a concern for that because Jesus never taught anybody to break his commandments. He never taught anybody to observe Easter. Mm. He never taught anybody to uh, observe Christmas and the things we talk about. But they, they think they've, they've heard Christians say that over and over again, and they know they practice that. So they come to the conclusion that, what's, that Christianity is just rehashed paganism. And I know uh, back in history, you can go back to Tertullian and some of the other historians, and they spent a great portion of their time arguing with the pagans, trying to convince them that Christianity wasn't paganism. That's right. The pagans said, hey, what you do is the same thing we do. So, so why should we be interested in your Messiah? And uh, so that's a big problem today that, uh, you know, the uh, people that are educated think that Jesus taught people to break the commandments. Another thing is the, the Jewish people, how could they ever accept a Messiah that teaches people to don't worry about those commandments. They've been done away with. You don't have to worry about that. Well, I think we've made it very hard for the Jewish people to come into Christianity because of the, the traditions and the paganistic uh, concepts that we have in the, the ecclesia or the assembly today, the church system. Uh, it makes it hard for them to understand that we've got the truth when they know that these things are an abomination to the That's Father right. and that uh, they could never take any part of that. And we tell them, yet you need to know the truth that we have about Yeshua HaMashiach, uh, our Savior, and it kind of it makes it hard for them to uh, uh, receive that. Well, that's exactly right. I know you use the biblical names. I, I notice you use that. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I use the King James Version of the Bible. Right. But when you say Yeshua, you're talking about what the King James calls Jesus. Yes, yes. Uh, we know that Jesus was not his name. Right. Uh, but, uh, you know, so people will understand, we, we use that terminology, at least I do, in the book, Too Long in the yes. Sun. And, uh, but uh, we know that, uh, that his name means uh, Yah is. That's exactly and, uh, right. So uh, the Jewish people could never accept uh, another Jesus. No. And we've talked about another Jesus on, right. our, on our previous programs. There's no way that they could ever accept a, a Savior, a Messiah, that says, hey, the Old Testament doesn't mean anything. No, uh, no way, shape, form, fashion. And we as uh, children of uh, the Father should not be able to accept that. You know, one of the things that bothers me is that we've put our own definitions in and, and left off the definitions of the Father. Whenever you look at the Word, it defines sin as lawlessness, right. breaking the law. Well, if that's the case, then by omitting or not uh, doing the law, what have we done? If our system teaches that there is no law that we're subject to today, have we not encouraged our people to be lawless? Yeah, practice sin. That's what Satan wants us to yeah. do. He wants us to practice sin. Uh, when we know the truth about God's commandments, we just have to have to change our ways. And repentance uh, is not what we hear a whole lot about. Uh, well, I, I'm not real sure that uh, people have a real good definition of repentance. The word, the Greek word that talks about repentance, gives a total different concept than most uh, Christian concepts of repentance that uh, I've heard. Uh, Repentance talks about several things. Repentance talks about turning from uh, evil and turning toward uh, God or Father Yahweh. And uh, repentance always also talks about not only turning from and turning to, <coughs> but changing our attitude about the thing we just turned from. Now, that's a different thing. For the Father has to deal with our attitude and our heart <laughs> condition. That's the thing. You can't... Uh, go into true repentance until there's been a change of heart condition. And, and he can change our attitude in a hurry, too. <laughs> he can sure get our attention. Well, uh, we just encourage people to uh, check these things out and uh, see what the commandments say. And uh, we ask you to prove all things, hold fast that which is good. We don't want you to believe what we say. Uh, the Bible says that the wisdom of man is, although with this world, is foolishness to God. But uh, the scriptures tell us how it is. And uh, we just want to do what God says. So uh, we just encourage you until our next program to, uh, once again, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, and earnestly contend for the faith once delivered to the saints. Pagan sun worship has been the apostate form of religion which opposed the true worship of our Creator. Knowing that sin is the transgression of the law and that the wages of sin is death, our adversary, by way of various aspects of sun worship, attempts to persuade us to break the first four commandments which teach us how to love the Lord. Second Corinthians refers to casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. It instructs us to bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Bearing this in mind, let us consider the fact that the non-biblical traditions of Christmas, Easter, and Sunday rest are nothing less than the imaginations of men which lead people away from the knowledge of God. The pagan sun gods of antiquity were known to have been born on the winter solstice, which in ancient times was December 25th. The pagan fertility goddesses of antiquity were honored at the very same time as Easter, and the sun gods of the Roman Empire were honored on what was known as the Day of the Sun, or Sunday. Nowhere in the Bible can support be found for any of these pagan observances, 
They are easily proven to be the inventions of men which derive from their own imaginations. In the past, these inventions provoke God to anger. The Bible says that people learn the works of the heathen, that they forgot God their Savior, which had done great things for them, and that they believed not his word. Let us not forget the great things that God, our Savior, has done for us. He laid down his life to pay the death penalty required for sin, which is the transgression of his laws. Surely our fathers have inherited lies, vanity, and things wherein there is no profit. Let us cast down these imaginations and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Welcome again to our program, Too Long in the Sun, where we invite you to join with us as we earnestly contend for the faith once delivered to the saints. Our topic today is imaginations. Uh, many of the things that I learned as I was growing up in church I found to be the imaginations of men that could not be found in the Bible. So what I'd like to do now is go to our screen and we'll have a look at some of these imaginations and see how they fit in with the true worship of our Creator. Uh, we're told that the mystery of iniquity or lawlessness is at work persuading many to question the commandments of God and as we go through, we'll be looking at that word, many. And uh, lawlessness is iniquity. In 1 John 3, 4, it tells us that sin is the transgression of the law, or lawlessness. And that's the very same word that Jesus used uh, when he said, people will be told, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. So we're going to have a look at the many. This is Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many, and here's this word many, will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. There's that word again, ye that transgress the law. The very same word used in 1 John 3, 4, where it says sin is the transgression of the law. So the question we have to answer uh, is who are the many? We know that in the name of Jesus they prophesy. In the name of Jesus they cast out devils. And in the name of Jesus they do many wonderful works. There's only, only one group of people doing these things in the name of Christ, those calling themselves Christians. So basically what Jesus said was that many people calling themselves Christians will be told that he never knew them and that as transgressors of his laws, they must depart from him. And that's a scary thought there. A lot of people want to talk about the fact that we're not under the law, that Paul says we're not under the law in Romans 6, 14. But look at what, he, what else he said. He said, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ. And that's 1 Corinthians 9.21. Jesus said, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And that word in Greek does not mean to end. It means to fill to the fullest or perfect. So he didn't come to end the law. For verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So yes, the Ten Commandments do apply to Christians. The scriptures tell us uh, who the saints are. In Revelation 14, 12, it says, Here is the patience of the saints, here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And in Revelation 22, it says, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they might have right to the tree of life and may be able to enter in through the gates into the city. And uh, that's exactly what we want. We want to be able to get into that city, and we're told that those that do his commandments will have right to the tree of life. We're not saved by works of the law. We're saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. But there's a lot of people that want to do away with the law, but uh, I don't know anybody that wants to keep God's commandments that wants to do away with grace. That's very important. 
Uh, Jesus laid down his life to pay the death penalty for repentant sinners. And, uh, you know, I think the, the word repent is very important there and is being overlooked in our churches today. A lot of people think you can just join up and do what you want to do, but that never was the way it uh, was supposed to be, and that was not what was practiced by the first century believers. Before they became members, if you, if you will, of the, of the congregation, uh, they realized that uh, they were giving up their lives to serve our Creator. Uh, they couldn't do the things they did before. They had to uh, uh, do differently and, and uh, act in a manner that was pleasing to our Creator. So let's go back to our slides here. The main thing we need to realize is that Jesus did not die in order that we might practice sin. Uh, we're told in 1 John 3, 4 that sin is the transgression of the law, and we're told that the carnal mind is enmity, that means hatred against God, for it is not subject to his law, neither indeed can it be. So he didn't die so we can do what we want to do and practice sin. Uh, if any of those commandments could have been changed, he would not have had to die. He could just change those laws. But because they could not, he paid the ultimate price for us. He laid down his life and paid that death penalty for us. Uh, he loved us enough to die for me, and I love him enough to try my best to keep his commandments. Now, a lot of people want to find something wrong with me, and that's not very hard to do. But we still have to keep his commandments. Uh, finding something wrong with me does not give anybody an excuse to break God's commandments. They stand fast forever and ever and are done in truth and uh, uprightness. So those things are not going anywhere. And Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So the final question we have to answer is, which laws are being broken by many Christians? We know that some Christians are being told, depart from me. So which laws are being broken by many Christians? In Matthew 22, a lawyer asked Jesus a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. There was no argument here. It was common knowledge that uh, that summed up the whole law, to love our neighbors, which is, tells us what the last six commandments uh, uh, refer to, and then the first four commandments teach us how to love the Lord. On those two statements, to love the Lord and to love our neighbor, hang all the law and the prophets. So that's a good summary. The lawyer tempting Jesus had no problem with the answer. In fact, uh, another lawyer did the same thing, and Jesus responded back by saying, uh, what saith the law? How readest thou? When he asked which is the you know, uh, which is the greatest commandment and, 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 and other questions. Jesus responded back by saying, what saith the law? So he referred right back to the writings of the Old Testament. Uh, it's important to realize that the believers of the first century didn't have the New Testament. They were going by the Old Testament scriptures. And uh, Jesus said that Moses wrote of them. And he said, if you won't believe Moses, you won't believe me. So it's very important to realize that those Old Testament scriptures are not something we need to overlook. The Bible is uh, an entirety, as an entire book from beginning to end. You can't separate one part from the other. Now, this is the summary here. This shows the two commandments. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. It was common knowledge back then that that summed up the Ten Commandments. So once again, to answer our question, which laws are being overlooked by many Christians? There's one that says, Honor thy father and thy mother. Thou shalt not kill. I can't think of any church anywhere that would teach us not to honor our fathers and mothers or to kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. I can't think of any uh, church anywhere in the world uh, calling themselves Christians that would teach us to break those uh, last six commandments. So the question is, which laws are being broken by many Christians? And I suggest that it is the first four commandments which teach us how to love the Lord, and many Christians are overlooking those things. The first four commandments teach us how to love the Lord. The last six teach us how to love our neighbor. And Jesus said in John 14, If ye love me, keep my commandments. 
So I'd like to look at, have a look at those commandments. The first commandment says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And that doesn't mean ahead of him. That means in his presence or before his face. Today, many, through deception, have been convinced that pagan activities are in honor of Christ. They place the traditional worship of pagan gods before his face and proclaim it to be in his honor. The second commandment says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Yet today the second commandment is, uh, is done away with by many people. They, many people, through deception, deem pagan images to represent the faith of Christ. And we're going to go into some detail on that on other programs. The third commandment says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Yet many, by proclaiming traditional worship of pagan gods to be in his honor, profane his holy name, giving it a connotation of emptiness, vanity, and falsehood. We can't proclaim pagan things to represent our Creator and Savior. The fourth commandment says to remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant nor thy maidservant nor thy cattle nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. The fourth commandment is now considered by many of those calling themselves Christians to be void and of no value. The transgression of the first four commandments can be traced directly to the inventions of men which were adopted from pagan sun worship and which are now accepted by many as traditional Christianity. The three major components of traditional Christianity are, in fact, pagan in nature, Easter, Christmas, and Sunday rest. They've been adopted from pagan sun worship, identical to the worship of Baal. They are in direct violation of the commandments of the Lord, our Creator. The mystery of iniquity, or lawlessness, is at work, persuading many to question the commandments of God, the covenant. And that's what we're talking about here, the covenant. We know about the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was a container or box that contained the covenant. That wasn't the old covenant or the new covenant. That was the covenant. And Jesus said that until heaven and earth pass away, nothing would change from that covenant. Uh, he can't change. He cannot lie. And when he states something, that's the way it is forever and ever. We can depend on it. There's not many things that we can depend on, but what, we, what he said, you can depend on it. If, if, it was, if it was any different, we wouldn't know what to believe. But uh, if we go by what the Bible says in the Scriptures and, and follow his instructions, then he can take care of us. We're going to do a video presentation today. Uh, it's entitled The Imaginations of Jerash. And uh, we're going to be looking at some of the imaginations that were going on uh, in the Roman Empire at Jerash, Jordan. Now this is a view of the Sea of Galilee. This is the Golan Heights, the southern Golan Heights. The Yarmouk River runs right down in that valley. This is Gadara. You remember the wild man of the Gadarenes that we read about in Scripture? Well, this is Gadara. Uh, it's right up the mountain there. You can see the uh, Sea of Galilee in the background. This is Hadrian's Arch. Uh, Hadrian was the Roman emperor that built Aelia Capitolina, the pagan city uh, where Jerusalem had been located. And this is his arch there at Jerash, Jordan. And what we're going to see in here is a whole lot of imaginations. Uh, this is the forum. Uh, we've heard of forums before. Well, this is a real forum. You can see the columns going around. Uh, these are the, this is the Cardo, the main street going down through there. Uh, if you look closely, you can see where the chariot wheels have worn grooves in the streets as they travel down through there. Uh, there was an earthquake in this area about 747 A.D. Uh, that destroyed the area and, and, and tore these things down. 
But uh, this was the showplace of the Roman Empire on the eastern frontier. And you can see that it was quite a city here. And what we, we're going to be doing is have a, having a look at some of the uh, pagan sun worship areas here, the imaginations of men. Uh, in this area, this is where they worship one of the uh, aquatic gods right here. There's fountains here. There's dolphins and depictions of all these things right here in this area. This is the uh, Grand Gate going up to the Temple of Artemis. And here you see the Temple of Artemis. If you remember uh, when they were crying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians in Ephesus. Well, if you go back to the Greek text, it was actually Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. This is the Temple of Artemis. And, of course, they uh, face the sun. The Temple of Zeus, we'll see here in just a few minutes, faces the sun. Uh, you can see here that it was quite an ornate building, a very special place that they took a lot of time and money to honor their gods. Now, this is a niche uh, where they would put that old pagan sun goddess, and this has come right on down to us as Easter. And you see here the multi-breasted fertility goddess of antiquity. And these people actually worship this thing. And uh, we know that uh, Artemis has come right on down to us. It was Ashtaroth, Eostra, uh, and by various other names that we've already covered on some of the other programs and it's come right on down to us as Easter. So we have these same imaginations right up in our churches. This is the Temple of Zeus in Jerash. Uh, it faced east and west. They, it faces the rising sun, and of course the sun when it goes down, and Zeus was the pagan sun god. Uh, the sun gods have come down to us by one name or another. Uh, it was Ra in, in Egypt, it's, uh, you know, Zeus here, and of course, Helios and Apollo and Jupiter and on and on and on. And uh, basically, uh, the sun gods came down to where they were had many of the same attributes as traditional Christianity has today, Sunday, December 25th. So these things have absolutely nothing to do with our Savior. They are the inventions of men. And now these inventions can be found right up in our churches. The question is, what are they doing there? Why can't we get them out? Uh, why don't we just stop doing these things? Why don't we just start resting on the Sabbath? Uh, why don't we stop doing Christmas and Easter? Why do we have to do those things? You can't find them in the Bible. The reason, the reason is they're traditions, and tradition is hard to break. They are the inventions of men. So at this time, I'd like to go over and uh, talk with Pastor Sandifer. Pastor Sandifer, thank you for being with us again. Thank you for having me. Uh, Surely our fathers have inherited lies, vanity, and things wherein there is no profit. Uh, what are we going to do about it? Well, it's come the time where you just turn around. You know, when if you realize you're wrong, you just turn around. And there's no question about the uh, transgression in these traditions that we've brought in. Uh, Deuteronomy 12, 4 tells us that we're not to do so. Darla, we're not supposed to incorporate these traditions or these uh, things of the pagans' uh, worship and bring them in and try to worship the Father with them. Well, of course, obviously, this is exactly what has happened over the years, that uh, the reason we have the pagan situations in here is because they did not want to uh, upset the pagans that were coming into the, the church uh, unregenerated. Well, I fear the same spirit operates in the church today. They don't want to separate the pagans from the uh, paganistic uh, yeah, the doctrines. Wheat, the wheat from the church. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, I tell you what, it's a real problem. Uh, all we can do is tell people the truth. I know that uh, many people that here say these things are shocked, and they can't believe we're calling ourselves Christians and saying these things. Yeah. But uh, if the first century believers were here today, they couldn't believe other people are calling themselves Christians and doing these abominable things. So uh, I know it's my responsibility, and I, I think you feel the same way, that we, we have to speak out and share the truth about these things. And, uh, you know, we don't want anybody to believe us, but uh, we do want to check it out. Certainly. I, you know, my thought is, is I believe that Paul was to walk into one of our churches today with all the, the paganism that's involved. Uh, uh, pardon the pun, maybe, but I don't believe you could hog time and keep them in there. <laughs> I don't think so either. I think they would run out. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, that's a shame. But, uh, you know, we don't have to do these things. We can uh, just stop doing it. We can repent and do what's right. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a letter here uh, from... Uh, 
someone that's in college that says, I learned most of this information while in college. He said, most of your data was presented in our study of Africa's pagan rituals. I took many history classes and was not saved at the time. Then after I received Christ, my husband and I did the usual church holidays and so forth for a time. As I began to study the word more deeply, I couldn't make sense of what I knew and what most Christians accepted. Uh, we stopped all of our pagan celebrations at home. Thankfully, at the time, our kids were really small, and it wasn't hard to break away from those things. They hadn't known any differently. They hadn't been steeped in the traditions. Right. The hardest thing for us is presenting this information to well-meaning friends and family without condemning, because most people just don't know. So how can we present these things to people without, uh, you know, in a kind manner, without offending them? You know, we shouldn't be offended at the truth, but, uh, you know, how do, we, how do we present these things to people? What do we do? It sounds strange. They want to say we're a cult. They want to, uh, you know, they, they think we're crazy. How do we, how do we show, them, show these things to them? I know the Holy Spirit has to show them, but uh, what do you think we need to do to get the word out? I think that all we can do is speak the truth, and we have to rely on the, the Ruach HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit, to brand that in their heart and their mind. And as far as offense, I don't think there's any way to stop the offense. Uh, the Word says that if your heart condemns you, how much greater is God? But if your heart condemns you not, then you can have confidence toward God. We need to have confidence toward the Father, that He's our helper. And uh, if something condemns us, then we ought to look at it. If I can tell you something out of the Word that condemns your heart, then you ought to examine your heart. You were mentioning earlier when we were at lunch about the fact that the flesh wants to cut up when it hears something true. Sure, sure. When truth, uh, that's one of the things I learned early when I started turning around into this truth is that whenever you hear truth, the first thing the flesh wants to do is rise up in anger you know, and get all irate. <laughs> Well, that's a good example that you might ought to pay attention and examine that real close. You remember we, we were reading a letter in the other program where the man jer jerked the prime time too long in his son's video out and stomped it in a million pieces true. and uh, then got to checking into things and uh, found out it was truth. And, and those people have since then inserted the too long in the sun newspapers in every newspaper in their city. So they checked the things out. They, you know, the, the, I guess, the, I guess his flesh was kind of cutting up a little bit, exactly. and exactly. he checked it out. And uh, that's what we ask that you do: is, uh, you know, check out the things that we say. We don't ask you to believe us. Uh, the Bible says, "Let God be true, and every man a liar." We're not lying to you. These things are the truth. You can check them out in your library, uh, in encyclopedias, and reference books. They're not hard to find out. So, uh, you know, I'm not a preacher. I'm not a teacher. I'm just a person. And when I found out these things, I was shocked, as I know many of you might be. But we just ask you to check them out. Uh, what can it hurt to check us out and see if we're wrong? And if we're wrong, let us know about that. Uh, I want to know the truth whether I like it or not. So uh, please go to your library. You may have the, library, the encyclopedias right there. Look up Sunday. Look up Easter. Uh, look up December 25th, and they will plainly tell you where they came from. They are the imaginations of men. I thought it might be good to uh, have a look here at uh, Revelation chapter 22. We know that in the holy city, God's there. And uh, the only ones that are going to get in are those that are written in the Lamb's book of life into the city. And uh, then in Revelation 22:14, we've already said this, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Uh, we've had a look at the fact that many people we told as transgressors of our Savior's laws that they must depart from, from him. And that's a scary, scary thought. It is. I think that would be the ultimate example of desperation. I think, uh, I think there's no more chances after that. Yeah. But uh, we do have a chance now. We can do what he says. And it's only by the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Holy Spirit was given to us to empower us to... Uh, Keep his commandments. I think that's part of the denying the power there, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof is not realizing what power we have in the Holy Spirit. That's God in us. That's right. And it's true that the uh, uh, church has many times uh, dis discredited the concept that you could keep the commandments. Okay, wait a second. 
Well, we can't do that. We, we've got to do what he says. We don't have a choice. That's right. If we're going to be his people, we have to have a choice. So we invite you to prove all things, hold fast that which is good, until our next program, Earnestly Contend for the Faith, once delivered to the saints. Welcome back. Well, we hope you enjoyed Richard Reeves' presentation as to what happened to the early church after the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. It didn't take <coughs> very long for some Satan-inspired humans to try and change the clear teachings of Jesus and his disciples into a church that took on a new look. Is it any wonder then that the Jews have a hard time today accepting the Christian teachings of Jesus when pagan inventions have replaced his righteous commandments and teachings? Listen to what Jesus said about the hypocritical false Christians and a false Christ and false prophets in Mark 7, 6 through 8. He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. They have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. Jesus Christ paid the penalty for all our sins so humans can be saved. But he also said that there would be many false prophets who would be preaching another gospel about another Jesus. We need to study God's word to, to make sure that we are not deceived. Listen to what uh, Jesus said in Matthew 24, 9 through 14. Here he says, Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and, and be put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of many will turn cold. But whoever stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Come back next week for <coughs> excuse me, another one of our inspiring Armory of Truth videos from Primetime Christian Broadcasting. God has not changed his perfect plan for all humans, even though many false teachers and false Christs will try to deceive us into following the imaginations and inventions of men. Remember, Jesus Christ came to show us how to obey God, and his purpose has not changed. As it says in Hebrews 13, 7 through 9, Remember your leaders who spoke to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. So long until next time.